It's a real privilege for us to have Dr. John Patrick with us this evening. Um, he is based in Canada and uh, near Ottawa in Canada, having trained as a medical doctor at King's College in London and particularly had a medical career in issues of nutrition for um, children and young people and nutritional short shortcomings in those situations and then looking at how culture plays a part in that and he's moved from that into a real concern for for medical ethics and faith and culture and so on and today speaks to Christian and secular groups around the world particularly around these issues of ethics culture public policy and integration of faith and science and very much involved in the Christian Medical and Dental Association in the U.S. and, and, this, and in Canada, um, and linked at the moment as President and Professor of History of Science, Medicine, and Faith at St. Augustine College in, in Canada. Um, John is married to Sally. They have four children and 22 grandchildren. As someone who has just rejoiced in having one grandchild, I think they are overly blessed. Um, and uh, one of their daughters, their eldest daughter, is a missionary in Malawi, which is what brings John and Sally here um, on a regular basis. And so it's really our privilege to have them with us and to have John speak to us. John gave me his card just beforehand, and, and he said that his commitment is that all young people particularly should be confident to answer questions around reductionism, relativism, tolerance, multiculturalism, the sanctity of life, and sexual ethics. So, John, I think we're going to just nail your, your foot to the floor and keep you here for about six months because um, there's obviously a lot that we could learn at your feet. But, and uh, I'm going to ask Belinda to to uh, bring the reading, and then let's hear what, what the Lord has to say to us through John. But it's lovely to have you with us, John. Really, really warm welcome, and to you, Sally, as well. The reading this evening is from Philippians, and it's Philippians 2, 1 to 13. It's from the Revised Standard Version. So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any incentive of love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy... Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfishness or conceit, but in humility count others better than yourself. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every, ooh, and every t tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For God is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Good evening. I think I need to pray, and I think you need that I should pray. So let us pray. <laughs> Father, we know that only as your spirit works in all our hearts and minds can anything of real significance happen. So we ask for that spirit now. Not only, Lord, do we ask for that spirit, but give us the gift of repentance that where we are wrong, we may come to you in repentance so that we may start again in the right place. In Christ's name, amen. Whenever I do this sort of thing, it's a kind of penance for me at one level. Um, 
especially when talking on this subject. God gave me a good mind, and I denied that for years and years and years uh, because I was well brought up, and if you have a gift, you have a responsibility, and I was thoroughly irresponsible. Uh, the only way to get out of the problem is to deny the gift. Um, eventually, of course, that charade came to an end. But before that point, uh, although I never ceased from my childhood to believe that the gospel story was essentially true, I mean, by the time I was 11 or 12, it, it seemed to me obvious, thousands, indeed hundreds of thousands of people, died willingly rather than deny Christ. You don't do that for something you know to be false. It's not an accident that nobody denied the resurrection for a couple of centuries after it. You have to have nobody alive who says, oh yes, my uncle, my great uncle, my grandfather, whatever. That's the way it worked. And only later did clever people start to say the sorts of things clever people say. And of course, the mind is one of the things that clever people are not very clever at. Uh, none of us have the, the slightest idea of how to explain consciousness. Nobody anywhere. We just don't understand it. We have a word for it, but we don't understand it. We don't understand the brain and the mind, the mind in particular. We have words for it, but not an understanding of how it works. And of course, it's got worse for us, particularly as Protestants, with what happened in the so-called Enlightenment, which I prefer to call an endarkenment, uh, because that's what it was. What happened there... Lots of things happen, but one of the important things that happened is the way we understand the idea of explanation was changed. In the modern world, we explain things by going to what we consider to be a deeper level. So we explain, we explain biology in terms of biochemistry and biochemistry in terms of biophysics and biophysics in terms of mathematics. And since mathematics is ultimately nonsense, it's all rather worthless. Um, <laughs> But the ancients didn't do that. The first thing they asked is, what is it for? So before the endarkenment, there were four basic principles that the world used to explain things. What's it made of? What ideas went to it? What tools were needed? And what's it for? Teleology. Now, Darwin in particular denied teleology. I love God's ironic revenge. Uh, DNA is a wonderful revenge on that particular piece of nonsense because, of course, when DNA was discovered uh, or its structure ar arrived at at the first level when I was about 13 years old, uh, Crick and Watson thought they'd done the job. Of course, they hadn't. Those were the days of genetic fundamentalism where one gene was supposed to be producing one protein and when it went wrong, that was one disease. Nobody believes that anymore. Uh, cystic fibrosis was the classic example of the one gene genetic fundamentalism. Now it's about 30 different varieties depending upon all sorts of other factors. And of course we've now got to the stage where from a single so-called gene we've got 30,000 different proteins. That's rather overwhelming. Uh, this particular point was uh, one of the moments in my life where God reminded me that he's much better at thought than I am. Uh, he does it regularly and I don't learn the lesson I keep needing to return to it. But uh, this one is beautiful. Uh, I've taught in Cuba a good many times, at least half a dozen. I don't keep track of these things. Um, th th there were conferences for Christian doctors in Cuba, which the government allowed. Uh, they knew what was going on. They followed it. On one occasion I ended up with quite a long discussion with the Minister of Health explaining why a, a Marxist system couldn't ultimately run a successful medical system uh, despite their best efforts. Um, and from the first occasion when I was there uh, and I looked at the programme and I said to the people running, this is all medicine, uh, but it's supposed to be Christian doctors. Shouldn't there be some Christian content? And they said, well, could you do that? I said, yeah, I can do that. So they let me. And that became a regular feature. Quite quickly, local pastors found out as well, so I ended up teaching them too. But on about the third visit, I think it was, uh, I'd given a lecture on some aspect of medicine. I can't remember what it was. Uh, but a gentleman came up to talk to me afterwards, and he didn't look like a doctor, and it turned out he wasn't. He was, in fact, the head of the Department of Marxism and Leninism in the local university. And I said, what are you doing here? And he said, I've come to see you. I said, why? 
And he said, well, the students tell me that you say Russia rotted from the inside. It was not brought down by American economic power. It was brought down by its own lack of virtue. Um, and he said, I agree with you. And in fact, when I saw that Russia was going to collapse, I knew that Cuba would be caught in the tailspin because they bought all our sugar. And we've had a very hard time. But I stopped teaching Marxism and Leninism, and instead I tried to teach multicultural ethics. He said, the only problem is the students go to sleep. But they tell me they don't go to sleep when you teach ethics. So I want to challenge you to debate me tomorrow morning in front of the faculty on the question as whether ethics requires transcendence or not. Can it be explained in scientific terms or does it need more? He says, I know what you're going to say to a degree and I don't mind losing. That was noble of him. <laughs> but I couldn't say no. Or I wouldn't say no to an opportunity like that. Um, but I had one evening to prepare. And I, I did my homework, said my prayers, and I had several starts that would work. It's like playing chess. The opening in a debate matters. Uh, but I also knew there was a much better way to do it. But I had no idea what it was. And the good Lord didn't tell me what it was until I got up from my seat in the front row to walk to the lectern. And he changed my, my ten-minute opening completely. Uh, I said to my translator, who fortunately was a Canadian Colombian, uh, what I told you a few minutes ago is not what's going to happen, so please pay attention. He said, this should be fun, and I said, I hope so, but it may not be. Um, and then I asked him to write on the blackboard behind me, this message assembled itself. And I asked the audience, the profs and the graduate students and all the rest, if you'd come into the lecture room and found this written on the blackboard, what would you make of it? And they said, well, it's a sort of sentence, this message assembled itself, but it's nonsense because the whole point about a message is that it comes from someone to someone. I said, quite right. Then I turned around and crossed out the word message and put in its place DNA. And I said, but you do believe this sentence, this DNA assembled itself because that's what Darwin teaches. But don't you see, it's exactly the same sentence as the one you've just said is nonsense. Because DNA is not you and me. DNA is a blueprint. It's not even the machinery. It's the blueprint to feed into the machinery to make you and me. And it's a pretty astonishing blueprint. Every one of you has roughly two meters of DNA in every cell in your body of some 3.5 billion letters in the right order. But God. God, from my point of view, only needs three-letter words and only needs four letters in his alphabet, and he can do that. They burst into applause. I'd won the debate. I didn't even need to rub it in that this cannot happen by chance. It's actually got much worse than that since then. It's almost impossible to explain. But just to put it this way, God doesn't waste space. He can write two messages on top of one another, and they both read sense since it reads off in triplets, so it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, up for basically a thousand letters in row, but he can also write another message in the same sequence, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and so on for a thousand. Both of them read sense. They both make a functional protein. That is absolutely stunning. John Lennox says the probability of that happening by chance is roughly one for all the molecules in the cosmos, i.e., it's it cannot happen by chance. The world is filled with meaning and purpose. And we in the modern world have no capacity for that. We don't teach it. And that's why our education system in many ways is falling apart. T.S. Eliot saw this coming in the 1930s when in a poem called Choruses from the Rock he has this line, where is the wisdom we have lost in knowledge? Where is the knowledge we have lost in information? Now we have deans of faculties who pride themselves on producing an information-rich environment. That's exactly what Eliot rightly feared. And the word wisdom doesn't occur in the university anymore. Now I add my own couplet to this, which is information is a medical student. It becomes knowledge in a resident. Information 
that is not understood cannot be used and so it's safe. But information that is understood can be used and it can be used badly. So you need wisdom when you're dying. You want somebody who knows when death is coming and doesn't meddle too much. And there are lots of other places. But there's no discussion of, meds, of, of wisdom in the medical school. No discussion of purpose most of the time. That's the world we live in. That's where our minds have got to at this stage. Now, I want to, if I can, I, I have about ten different starts, all of which would work, and that wasn't one of them, so I'm already off track. Um, but I, I want to move on to just to make you think a little bit about how your mind was and was not involved in your conversion. Those of you who are not Christian, uh, you may find it interesting to listen to what comes next. Uh, just as an aside, uh, every now and again in the, on the lecture circuit, I will meet somebody who knew me from my days as a trendy scientist. And uh, they turn up at a lecture because your mugshot appears on lecture notices in universities. And afterwards, if they're British, they'll come and say hello. And then they'll say something like, I haven't seen you for years, to which the answer is, yeah, I understand that. I stopped coming to the conferences where we met. In the 90s, he said, yes, I used to meet your, read your stuff until the mid-90s. The clear implication being that I lost my mind in the, middle, in the mid-90s. And I say, you think I lost it? He said, well, what you write now is rubbish. I said, oh, you think that? I think I can prove you're wrong. When someone loses their mind, what do you call them? And, of course, you call them mad or crazy. What happens to their life? Well, it falls apart. Well, mine hasn't. In fact, if anything, even my wife would acknowledge it's a bit better rather than worse. Uh, so your problem is that you've bought a pup. You think the reductionistic modern scientific view of the world is capable of answering all the questions, but it isn't. There's plenty of room in my box for reductionistic science. I think that's the right way to do it. But there's no, no room in your reductionistic box for meaning, for love, for fidelity, for honour, for justice, because they're all immaterial. Science can say nothing about them. It can, of course, say things like, when you got converted, your neurotransmitters changed. I imagine they did, but that's not an explanation. That isn't the way it works. That's a scientific explanation, perhaps, but not unless you can make it more causal than that. Now think of your own conversion. I would put it to you that none of you in this room had a conversion which you can take off yourself and lift it and put it on someone else. It doesn't work like that, does it? Conversion, amazingly, is totally unique to every one of you. God, in his wisdom, deals with us that way. Lewis understood that beautifully in his account of his own conversion in uh, Surprised by Joy. He, he's a very smart man. In fact, he thought he was the smartest man in Oxford till I've forgotten her name now, but a cigar-smoking woman beat him in debates, and he never debated again after that. Um, it's a Catholic theologian. Her name is gone at the moment. I've reached that age. It'll come back in a minute or two, probably. Um, anyway, uh, he finished his first degree, which he got first-class honours, but there wasn't a job. His father could afford it, so he did a second degree in English literature. And he went to his first Oxford tutorial with eight or nine students there. Uh, you put smart students together, and they know who the brightest students in the group are within two or three minutes. And he knew by the end of that first tutorial. There were two guys in that class who were the smartest ones. And they were both Christian, and that worried him because he was an atheist. He didn't know they were going to have a major impact on British faith, and he was too, but he didn't know that. And they persuaded him that he was a fool to be an atheist. And the argument is Pascal's wager. It's still true. If there is no God, and I believe there is one, I don't lose very much. I live with decent people who I like enough to get on. Life is okay. But if I believe there is no God, and you must believe it, you can't prove it. It's technically unprovable. And I'm wrong. Then I go to hell. That's a bad move. Now, that's Pascal's wager, sort of dumbed down, if you like, but it's true. And Lewis, they persuaded Lewis that he was wrong to be an He should at least be a theist. 
I mean, the, the, the first question is something or someone. And where we've got to now, someone is increasingly more likely than something. Uh, to ima imagine somebody made a chair is much easier than imagining the chair made itself. You know, that's even at the simplest level. Believing in a mind behind the universe, particularly when we start looking at the complexities of physics and modern molecular biology, it's not surprising uh, that quantum physics and, uh, and cosmology have the highest proportion of Christian professors, shortly to be followed, I think, by molecular biology, but that's going to take another generation. It's happening already. Uh, famously, Francis Collins, who is a, an evangelical Christian, uh, would simply say to the students working in his lab, wow, that's amazing, isn't it? He didn't need to say anymore. He just encouraged the sense of awe which we have lost. And we need to do that. And you can start with your own conversion. Now, in Lewis's case, that made him a theist, a rather uncomfortable one, because if there is a God that makes me a creature, I'd better pray. He'd not done that. And of course, if you get down on your knees and ask God to show you something of yourself, he will, and it won't be pleasant. And it wasn't for Lewis. He said, I discovered that I was a zoo of ambition, a bedlam of hatred, a harem of fondled hatred. My name was Legion. He discovered sin, which is what everybody does who has the honesty to get on their knees. What did he do about it? He didn't know what to do about it. He tried to escape into deism, but it didn't work. And a couple of weeks later, he got on the bus at Magdalen College to take the five-minute journey up Headington Hill to where he lived. And... Whilst he was on the bus, he knew he was, all he can do is mix similes. He says, I knew I was being offered something. It was like taking off stiff clothing, removing a suit of armor, like being a snowman pushed out into the sun and beginning to melt. It was unpleasant. He didn't know what it was he was saying yes to. In retrospect, he thinks he said yes to God. Uh, the next thing was even worse. He didn't know what to do with Jesus. And then he went with his brother on the motorcycle to Whipsnade Zoo and watched the wallabies jumping around in the bluebells for a little while. And when he got back, or somewhere in that period, he found that he did believe that Jesus was the Son of God. And he doesn't tell you why he believed or how he believed, because he didn't know. But what he did know is that something had happened. He was beginning to see with new eyes. And that was... Personal and undeniable is what Polanyi calls personal knowledge. And that's step one in conversion. But because we, particularly in the Protestant church, really came to life at a time when scientific reductionism was growing strong and was producing amazing results, far too often we try to force people into a box so that everybody has the same sort of conversion story. That's a very silly thing to do. Because it isn't that way. God deals with you as an individual. He made you as an individual. And if you think about your conversion, I think what I'm telling you does in fact make sense. It's the way it works. You know that it has happened. You're not exactly sure what it is. But as life goes on, you look back and realize. Sometimes you can't even say where the moment of change happened. That's something we like to do, but God doesn't always do it that way. Strikingly, many years ago now, a young man moved in next door to us in London where we lived in a little block of six apartments with his wife and two children. Turned out he was a brilliant young man, a working-class boy whose dad had said, leave school, get, earn some brass in Derby, and he'd gone to work for Rolls-Royce as an as a, uh, apprentice electrician. But Rolls-Royce suddenly re quickly realized he wasn't an apprentice electrician and moved him into the heat flux division of nuclear engines and before very long he was actually he'd got an external degree in mathematics in three years from London University and he was running the heat flux program uh, Americans would come and look at what they were doing at Rolls and at the end of the trip around that bit of the tour they'd say Dr. Dawson this is amazing work and he would say Mr. Dawson uh, he uh, Rolls, of course, were deeply embarrassed. Uh, they wanted him to get a PhD because it would look better, to which his response was, I have to teach those idiots what to do. What do I want a PhD for? Um, they managed to persuade him to do 
an MSc in nuclear engineering, which was a one-year program at Greenwich Naval College. We thought, I don't mind a year off. I, I can afford that, and it'd be nice to go to London. And he moved in next door to us. Everything he touched was turning to gold. He never bought a new car. He went to the scrapyard, found three wrecks of the same model, and built a new one. Uh, he built his own house. You know, He was that kind of guy. There was nothing he couldn't do, but he was unhappy. I didn't know that. He says... He said later that I had meningitis so that he would become a Christian because I was just about 18 months into my PhD and I hadn't got a single result. And Then I got meningitis, so I was off for three months. And uh, we got to know one another. We had a little garden around the block of six apartments and it was summer. And we started playing chess in the garden when he came home in the evening, in the afternoon, actually. He got bored by that stage. And anyway, one day... I. Whilst we were playing chess, I, I got a bad headache, as you do when you're recovering from meningitis. So I said, David, I can't finish this game. I have to go in and lie down. He said, fine. The next day when he came back, he said, have you got any more books like the one you left in the garden? Yes, I said, oh, I said, is that what happened to it? I don't know. I've never met anybody else who's been converted by reading a commentary on the book of Habakkuk. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what happened. Because he was miserable, and God is saying to Habakkuk, you're going to be very miserable because what I'm going to do to Israel is going to make you miserable. And Habakkuk says, you're God, you can't do that. And God says, just watch me. Uh, but that book ends with one of the most beautiful pieces of poetry in the Old Testament. Anyway, it got to David as he realized he was actually being very successful and was very unhappy. He didn't understand the world, and... Habakkuk didn't understand the world, but Habakkuk got to a conclusion that he would like to get to. He said, have you got any more books like that? So I gave him mere Christianity. He read it in two days, and he said, can I come to church with you on Sunday? I didn't do anything. But he was turned around in three days with two books. He went back to Derby, and he said, it was as though I had new eyes. He'd lived in a village, and... He said, I never noticed before that the young people had nothing to do, and so, of course, they were getting into minor vandalism, so he started a youth group. He went back to his department in Rolls-Royce. He said, oh, I started to realize they really were people, and I should take an interest. He ended up as head of personnel for the whole of uh, Rolls-Royce when he retired. But he once came all the way to Jamaica to change the rear bearings on my, on my Zab. Um, that's what happens. That's what we need to talk about. When I tell these scientific friends who knew me in the past, I say, you've missed the point. I can't explain to you how you become a Christian. I can tell you that if you seek, you're fine, and I can tell you it can take up to 15 years or longer sometimes. Uh, but if you go on seeking, uh, it, you will get there. But it's, it's not in your hands as to when it will be. We need to tell what the Lord has done for us. That's, what, that's the only thing you're required to do. How many times in the last week have you told somebody what the Lord has done for you? That sh there should be an opportunity to do that every week. And if it's incoherent, that doesn't matter. Uh, as salvation to a rationalist is totally incoherent. God knows that. My ways are not your ways, neither are my thoughts your thoughts, saith the Lord. Well, that's true. We cannot possibly understand God, but he can come to us at a level that we can understand and not deny. It's called tacit knowledge. You all know examples of it. Uh, New Begins, Foolishness to the Greeks, is the first book to read, I think, to get to it, although Polanyi is the person you get to in the end. Uh, but I can explain to you what's at issue. I, I love Polanyi's favorite example. Polanyi was a Jewish guy. I don't know whether he ever became a Christian, a Hungarian. Very smart. When he was in his early 20s, he corresponded with Einstein, and Einstein was willing to continue the correspondence. He was smart. He would have got a Nobel Prize in chemistry, but he became worried about philosophy because in 1917, the Russian Revolution occurred, and Polanyi knew that this would be very bad news for Hungary if it succeeded because it would spread. He talked to the Russian Minister of Science and asked what science policy would look like and he said something very stupid that you're hearing in South Africa too uh, from students and others that the proletariat will tell the scientists what to do. 
No. I wouldn't get out of bed for any other protein than the one that I did for 25 years. I don't know why it grabbed me right at the beginning, but it did. You can tell a technician what to do because what could be done can be defined from what's already known. That's not true of real science. It has to grab you in some way. Now, it's true even in real craftsmanship, and that's what fascinated Polanyi. When he got to Manchester just in time uh, to avoid the Nazis in Germany, where he went first, he became fascinated by working men. Now, when I was young, I come from a blue-collar background. My grandfather was a Rolls-Royce toolmaker. My uncles were toolmakers. They were proud men. They did very good work. My grandfather claimed to be able to work to a ten-thousandth of an inch. I mean, that's nothing now. An ordinary production car has tighter tolerances than that now. So once computer-assisted design came along, toolmakers were redundant overnight pretty well. Nobody cared. The one thing Trump really understood, and for which uh, I was delighted to see, was he understood blue-collar alienation. And it really is the, the... Where I grew up was a proud environment. It was working class in what was then the biggest industrial city in Britain, and we didn't lock our doors. Nobody went... One person went to university in 40 years before I did. It wasn't a hotbed of intellectual activity. But the police never visited. We didn't need them. My mother had the family gift of the gab. She could talk to any audience and engage them. It seems to go through all generations in our family. Uh, and she was often in demand for women's groups. And she'd come back sometimes late at night. On the bus, we never had a car. Walk for ten minutes through semi-darkened streets after the Second World War. And my father didn't even bother. Because there was no risk. There were no attacks on women. None. Can you imagine that in South Africa? Or Detroit? Or even Birmingham now. That's all gone. And we are responsible. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. When Christians stop being salty, the world degenerates. It's only doing what comes naturally. And that's where we're at, almost worldwide now. So conversion. Uh, Poldanius' example is making a violin. He found a man who was making very good violins in his shed at the bottom of the garden. Who decided they were good? Violinists, right? People from the Halley Orchestra were buying his violins. That's good enough. Uh, watching him and talking to him, he realized that this was a perfect example of something he was trying to understand. See, a man who's a craftsman and makes good violins can't tell you how he does it. Just like a surgeon can go into the operating room and in two minutes he knows how good the guy who's operating is. When you ask him how he knows, he starts rationalizing he knew first. The way he handles tissue, there are all sorts of things you can rationalize, but you know first. And so if you want to be a violin maker, you go to a man like this and you say, sir, will you teach me to make violins? And he says, show me your work. And in most cases, you say, don't waste your time. You're never going to be a violin maker. But every now and again, he says, oh, you might have it. Uh, watch, sweep the floor, make the coffee. Eventually you get given a valuable piece of alpine pine and he says, cut out the top of the violin or the bottom. And he says, no, give it to me and he feels it. And he knows what he's feeling for, when, whether this wood will sing or not. It's got to fit together perfectly. He knows when he's achieved it, he knows when he hasn't, but he can't tell you how he does that. Conversion is exactly like that. When it's happened... You can't deny it. And nobody can tell you that you don't know what you're talking about. But you can't tell anyone else how to do it. God knows what he's doing. Tacit knowledge is another form of knowledge. Now, I haven't really got going very well. I'm glad I can't see my wife because she'd be telling me to get on with it by this stage. But you're listening, and that's important. Um, the mind in the Christian life is, is not being attended to. Let me, uh, let me play a game on you. Uh, you I'm sure you're good-hearted. You'll, you'll play for the sport. You're South African, after all. You like sport. Or, and unlike the Australians, so far you're not cheating too much. Even that's not true. Yeah. Uh, they all cheat now. But um, Paul says, the preaching of the cross 
is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who have been saved, it is the power of God. Now, I don't see any of you jumping up. Even your rector is still sitting on his seat, although I suspect he knows what I've done. But what I've just done is trash the cultural history of the Western church in one sentence, and none of you seem to care. Do you want a second try? The preach- I, I paraphrased it, of course, to make it harder. The preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who have been saved, it is the power of God. Raise your hand if you know what I've done. Not one that I can see. Oh, one behind the... Yeah, okay, good, one. That's about right for an Anglican church. Uh, now let me do it right and see if you can pick up the difference. Paul says, The preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. You see the difference? Salvation should be present continuous. Can you stand up now and say how God has saved you in the past week? That's what Paul wants. In fact, if you go through the epistles and look at what Paul says about praying for people, it's when things are starting to happen, when they are living differently. He says, now it's really worth praying for you. Because there's evidence that the Spirit is at work. Present continuous salvation has got lost. If you haven't been doing if you haven't been experiencing it, then you need to make it an item of prayer for you. I'll come back to that in a little later. In other words, if we thought like Christ thought, we would be doing that. We read that lovely passage we had that lovely passage from Philippians read to us. Let this mind be in you, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And that questionable verse earlier on is questionable for me because I am never sure whether it's a promise or a curse. Uh, He who has begun a good work in you will complete it. Uh, I can hear my mother sometimes with the the lesser version of that. But yes, that's true. We we need to take this very seriously. Uh, We're not doing it. Now, One of the ways that that I force myself to take the scriptures more seriously is something that I would encourage you to do. Raise your hand if you know what a praise is. Good, it's still old-fashioned, but I see it's mainly the grey-haired, not the younger ones. They don't know how to do it. It, It's been dropped. But have you ever written a praise of a, a chapter of the Bible? Raise your hand if you have. One. Change that. Uh, the college at which I now teach, uh, the history of ideas with others, uh, intellectual history, uh, taught from the premise that we're the product of Hebrew and Greek thought modified by the church. That's who we are in the Western tradition. Uh, And students can't defend that at all. And it's very easy to defend by doing some work. But the first exercise I give my class every year is I say, they're all Christians, notionally, uh, but not very deep. And I say, I know that you've all heard Ephesians 1 and 2 read many times. Tell me the argument. Stand up and tell me Paul's argument in the first two chapters. How many students do you think have ever stood up? None. You've all heard Ephesians 1 and 2 many times, but you couldn't give the argument. That's unacceptable. You've got to change that. And you do it by writing a praise A praise fundamentally is taking... a a piece to pieces. If you want to find out why a building stands up, you remove everything that doesn't bear weight and then you can see how it works. What you're doing with Paul is removing everything that isn't essential to the argument till you can see the argument. You don't need metaphors, you don't need similes, you need simple sentences, not complex ones, etc. You can get it down to 20 lines and you'll never forget the argument again. I mean, yes, to unite all things in Christ is the the overarching theme, but there's a structure to it. And once you see it, you won't forget it. Now, I I was forced into doing this with Scripture, I think by the Holy Spirit. I hadn't done it before. But uh, we lived in, my wife and family, and I lived in the Caribbean in Jamaica for seven years. Uh, Basically, I was studying one protein, but I was also part of a team that was caring for 10-pound two-year-olds, very severely malnourished children. You had to be that bad or worse to get into the unit because it was a research unit. Slowly, over a 25-year period, we built the protocols uh, that uh, are now 
the standard procedure for those children, although I've yet to go to a mission hospital doing it properly. The first time we came to South Africa was 1986-87, but on that occasion I wasn't an active Christian, and it was John Hansen who was a professor of paediatrics at WITS who persuaded me to come because there was an academic boycott in those days, and he said, I think the ANC will let you in. After all, only black children get malnourished, and they did. It was a wonderful experience. Um, it gave us the love for South Africa as we saw hope, uh, and we also saw uh, some aspects where there was more depth than in other parts of the Western world, but that's uh, for another time. But in due course, uh, we started going to Central Africa as well, and... When I got back from one of those trips, uh, I'd read Alan Bloom's Closing of the American Mind in which he said that the modern student is basically an empty slate because they have no cultural history to build on. They don't know their own story. Now, Alan Bloom was a radical homosexual Jew and an atheist, but he wanted his, and the best teacher of Plato and Aristotle in the University of Chicago. But he could not teach them without their knowledge of the Bible, because most of the important metaphors come from the Bible. You don't know the Bible, you can't understand your own language. Uh, You may understand every word and miss the meaning, and he understood that. Uh, Somehow in a biochemistry lecture to medical students, I said, if Alan Bloom is right, you're an ignorant bunch. Uh, Nowadays, you'd probably get a riot, but this was 20 or more years ago. I only got a bunch of 20 students demanding an apology. And I said, well, it's not me, it's Alan Bloom and I don't intend to apologize, and he's not here to do so. But we're a quasi-experimental faculty. Um, Why don't we do the experiment? And uh, they said, what do you mean? I said, well, Alan Bloom says, if you don't know the Bible, your mind is not properly formed. And let's take the Sermon on the Mount. uh, Gandhi thought it was wonderful, the best piece of writing he'd ever found, so you you never disagree with him. Tell me how it starts and what it says. And of course he couldn't do that. They couldn't do that. They didn't know anything. And I said, well, there you are, he's right. And then bless them, they said, what are you going to do about it? And my initial response was, well, it's your problem, not mine. I don't intend to do anything about it. I'm too busy. And they said, but you claim to know something we ought to know. Why don't you teach us? And I said, well, you don't even know the questions, let alone the answers. What you need is an Agnostics Anonymous group, and AA was born on the spot, and I had an extracurricular course in which I set out to prove to them that objective moral truth was a real entity, and every year I won. But as I walked away, I realized that I couldn't give a proper account of the Sermon on the Mount. Now, if you're made to be a professor, giving lectures is not a problem. Uh, It comes with the territory. So... uh, Any professor who didn't apply for the job but was asked to apply can give lectures. It's not not an issue on the things you know about. A lovely example not so long ago, one of my friends was helping an elderly professor up the steps, and as he got to about here, he said to Graham, what am I talking about? And Graham told him, oh, yes, yes, he said, and away he went for an hour. Uh, That's the way it is. And I could do that with quite a lot of subjects, but not with the Sermon on the Mount. Unfortunately... I'd read a book that many... How many of you have read Life Together by Bonhoeffer? One. I think you would do very well to read that in small groups in South Africa at the moment. Because what Bonhoeffer is looking at is a situation where the government is totally opposed to Christianity. And that could happen here. And he's telling them how to survive. Uh, It's not a thick book, it's a little book. But it's brilliant. And in the middle of it was one sentence that had got to me. He said, when your Christian life is in the doldrums, when you're not enjoying it and it's not alive for you, ask God to give you a passage of Scripture from him to you personally, and he will do it. Just add it to your prayers, and sometime in the next few months, you will see, I've got to deal with that passage. In my case, it was three chapters, which I quickly learned by heart, and then... It was like water falling in the desert. It came to life. It takes me three hours to get through the Sermon on the Mount now. I'm not going to do it tonight. Relax. I would if you'd let me, but I know you won't. It's too late. It was a transforming process. And I doubt that I now go through a day without the Sermon on the Mount appearing in my mind at some point. 
Jesus thought in that kind of way. Well, there's so many bits of the, the Gospels that are left hanging. I don't know if you've ever noticed what precedes the first beatitude in Matthew 5. It's astonishing. I'm sure you haven't, actually. I hadn't for years either. But at the end of Matthew 4, he's healing lots of people. And then the next morning, Jesus looks out, seeing the crowds, he went up the mountain. Imagine, you go to outpatient, see the crowds, and go up the mountain. I want to know what happened. I know from other bits of scripture. I mean, he looked out and he said elsewhere, I do nothing except what the Father tells me to. And he said, Father, what do I do? And the Father said, go up the mountain and teach. And aren't we glad that he did? All the people that Jesus healed later died. But the people who took the Sermon on the Mount into their hearts live forever. Uh, he d God knew what he was doing on that occasion. Isn't it a, an amazing thing to be able to say, I do nothing except what the Father tells me to. Paul, I, I, I wish I understood when he says, the life that I now live is not mine, but Christ living in me. Uh, to le lose that dreadful sense of self and be caught up in God is an amazing thought. Lewis, I think in The Four Loves, says something like this. He says, maybe the reason there will be no regret in heaven is the only parts of us that we'll be really present to in heaven are the parts that Christ has already inhabited, made perfect. It's quite a thought. Uh, certainly something like that must happen, but I don't know. We haven't been told. But the next thing that got to me about Jesus was in John 13. That's the washing of the disciples' feet. Again, you probably haven't noticed what, how the chapter starts. I was trying to write a prayer. I haven't done the Upper Room Discourse yet. It won't, it's coming slowly. I've been at it for about 10 years. It's not easy to do. But when you first try it, you, you read a chapter and then note down what you think you've read and then go back and look what you've missed. That's the most interesting thing. And what it says at the beginning is astonishing. It says, Jesus, knowing that his time had come, knowing that everything had been put into his hands, washed the disciples' feet. That's not what we do. If you're an academic and you knew everything, you'd be scribbling like mad before you died so that you would leave behind an incredible reputation. But no, Jesus didn't do any of that. He washed the disciples' feet. And then he said, you call me Master and Lord. And you do right, for that is who I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, wash your feet, what ought you to do? It's a no-brainer, isn't it? Washed any feet recently? I mean, that can come in all sorts of ways. Uh, but you don't have to think long before you find the holes in your life where... As David, my friend, when he went back to Rolls, said, I hadn't bothered about any of the people that I was responsible for. I've been like that, still am in many ways. Uh, there is change over time, and that's what's really exciting because it's so refreshing. I love the end of Thomas Aquinas' life. There he was. he just not quite completed the greatest intellectual feat in five centuries. And a few months before he died... He was in the chapel, and another monk was there, and Thomas was in a trance. He heard two sentences, one from Christ and one from Thomas. Christ said to Thomas, it is well done, Thomas, what do you wish? And Thomas said to Christ, only you, O Lord. And he never finished the Summa. He never wrote another word after that meeting with Christ. The greatest intellectual feat in 500 years was mere straw compared to one conversation with Christ. That gives you some sense of what we're headed to. The best that we've done is only a step on the way. He prepared good works for us to do, not because he needs them. He has no needs. He could do it all without us, but because we need them. And one of the things we need to do in the church is renew the mind. Paul, in one of his epistles, says, if you've followed my argument, then you ought not to be like the people around you. You need to be 
transformed by the renewal of your feelings. Enough of you know that one. But most people actually come to church to feel better, don't they? That's a disaster. You come to church to think better. The pastor has a terrible job. His job is to make you think, and that will make you feel terrible. Now, if you are obedient to what you discover, God can make you joyful anywhere, anytime, any place. He can do that. It, it, Lewis says somewhere else, if you go looking for joy, you will never find it. But if you are obedient, it will creep up on you. Uh, love for a Christian is not complicated, is it? I think it's an unstoppable definition. If you love me, keep my commandments. Any of you in any doubt as to which the next commandment is likely to be for you? If you are, get on your knees and you won't be in any doubt for long. Uh, that's the way it works. Now, it's already seven minutes to eight, I think, if that clock is right. Uh, I haven't got anywhere near what I intended to do, but can I take another few minutes? Okay, because uh, I, I want to leave you with some practicalities. And they're important for building your mind. The first is you need, a re you need to belong to a serious reading group. Now, serious reading is going to be different for different people. It's like learning to be an athlete. Uh, you don't get there in one go. The first time I read McIntyre's After Virtue, it took me a year to do it. The second time, I did it in about two weeks. And the third time, I read it on the plane from uh, Washington to Johannesburg. Uh, it's just like athletics. When you train, when you train for anything, you get better at it and you enjoy it more. So ditch your double-spaced romantic Christian novels and never pick up another one. Uh, they're trash. Don't bother with them. If you want a good novel that will set you back on your knees, try Michael O'Brien's Island of the World, uh, published by Ignatius. He's a Catholic writer. He's a friend. He lives in the Ottawa Valley. He never went to university, so he's not tainted by that experience. He's also a very good artist. Uh, I have never read a novel like that one. My wife doesn't normally read novels, but when I read that one, I said, Sally, you might read this one. She couldn't put it down. And that has been the experience of all our friends to whom I have recommended it. It will reduce you to tears and prayer several times. Uh, I won't say any more about it than that, but it will give you a new dimension for what a Christian novel should look like. And you won't read the trash anymore because you'll have a higher standard. That would get you reading at the novel level. But you live in a world where public policy is the issue. Uh, it is worldwide. And Christians are supposed to be the people who change that. Uh, and at their best, they do. The 18th century revival, unlike many others, changed the world. I mean, when With Wesley and Whitfield started preaching, London was a very bad place. It was said that every sixth house in the city sold gin. And the advertising was drunk for a penny, dead drunk for two, clean straw for three. I mean, life was so bad, people wanted to escape. That's what happens. That's drunkenness happens under those circumstances. Now, Wesley had done everything right. He was a good Christian young man. He'd gone to Oxford. He visited the poor. He visited the prisoners. He had Bible studies, and he wasn't a Christian. He was a prig. He became a missionary, and that was even worse. The Americans sent him back. They couldn't stand him. And then he gets back to England, and he's asked to go and say prayers with some men who are about to be executed. And he tells them the gospel, which he knows, and then he writes in his journal, I can save others, but who will save me? He got that wrong. Of course, he didn't save anyone. But at least he saw the power of the gospel right there in front of him. And it was a little later when his brother persuaded him to go to uh, a little uh, Bo uh, Moravian church in the back streets of London. And he says, he was listening to a man, not even reading the Bible, but reading Luther's introduction to Romans in broken English. And he says, my heart was strangely warmed. And for the first time, I knew that I was a child of God. And the rest, as they say, is history. 
Out of that revival, the abolition of slavery, the end of child labor, the reform of the prisons, the repeal of the corn laws, in other words, serfdom was gone, an amazing outcome. 20th century, no, because we are too reductionistic. We think if you sign a set of propositions and sign at the bottom, you become a Christian. No, you don't. That's not the way it happens. Only God can bring you to faith. No human being can do it. And if you've never got there, start searching. It's worth it. It keeps you young. I can, uh, uh, I'm about to approach my 80th year, the beginning of it, in about three weeks' time. Uh, I wake up every morning and say, Lord, everything still seems to work. That's amazing. Thank you. What do I do next? And you can trust him. Just like that episode in Cuba, the worse the situation, the more amazing it becomes. I, I've learned this over the time, but one of the first occasions which I learned a bit about this was the Canadian government uh, some 20 years ago wanted to, they were trying to legalize euthanasia under the disguise of making sure doctors weren't uh, prosecuted for using large amounts of morphia, which got nothing to do with it. It was an, a euthanasia bill. And it was at the reading level, so it just had a formal vote after the committee stage. And one Catholic senator's assistant realized that all the people presenting to it were the pro-choice crowd. Two days left. He had to find three people in Ottawa who took the other point of view. And we had one day to write our uh, accounts of why we thought this was a bad bill. I was one of them. I was the third to go. The first was André LaFrance, who knew all the details about what had happened elsewhere. A bit dull, but everything was there. Then John Scott, who's a palliative care physician, who gave a beautiful exposition of why palliative care is essential to medicine. I came last. The guy who spoke before me um, was dull. In fact, several of the committee fell asleep. So when I got to the microphone, the, the chairman of the committee said, Dr. Patrick, we will read your submission into Hansard. Don't read it. Speak to us. So I was commanded to put my prepared speech down. And I started off. I wish that I had written what I said. By the time I got to the end, I was on a high. I mean, it, it, it was brilliant, and it wasn't me. It was a gift. And later somebody sent me Hansard, and the chairman said, Dr. Patrick, if you use... Uh, a scalpel like you use words I would love to come and watch uh, those three stopped the submission and we got another 20 years but now we've done it and we're in the midst of killing one another and we know that wherever in the western world euthanasia is legalized per 10 million population there will be 500 to 1000 people killed every year without any evidence of consent within no time at all so if you go into an emerge and you're a street person and there's nobody around, you'll probably come out dead, and so on. Nothing has happened. All the safeguards have not worked. We are supposed to be involved in that area. So you need a, a group in your church who start thinking about these things together. Now, on my website, which is johnpatrick.ca, there is a book list, and there's also a list of articles now, you can just take articles from first things, and I would suggest Budyshevsky's The Revenge of Conscience to read first, if you're interested in these things. When you've read it, take a paragraph that gets to you and put it in the church bulletin. I'm sure your rector will agree to that. And then they say, if this interests you, come and see me, and then you start reading together. Once you start, you won't stop. When we arrived in George, we were surprisingly met at the airport by people we didn't expect, who we thought were in Bloemfontein but they happened to be in George, and they picked us up. And Uta said, you'll be pleased to know that the reading group is starting its 20th year this year. Uh, the reason she told me, of course, was what I just told you. I told this group in Blom Bloemfontein 20 years ago. They've had a reading group going for 20 years. So start some serious reading. Uh, you need one on education as well, uh, because it's in trouble. Now... What next? So the Precy, the life text, giving attention to reading, pushing yourself to read beyond your current level, be like an athlete, move it along, uh, do it together, 
Um, then I, I want to finish with this. The basic formation of a disciple as opposed to a mere believer is exactly what Jesus does in his first sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. In a mere 10 verses, he does better than any psychology textbook has ever done. And it's totally countercultural. And you have to live within his culture, not the modern one. The first start to human psychology for Jesus is, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, what you have to do, these are obviously aphorisms, you have to compare scripture with scripture and find out what, he was, what did he say next. And I think he said something like this, you are a mess. You're all a mess. I'm a mess. We are all a mess. And if we get down on our knees and ask God to show us what we look like to him, we will acknowledge it. That's poverty of spirit. And he says, you already have the kingdom. Why? Because he knows when you become honest to the point where you can face what's in yourself, to the extent that he lets you see, he won't overwhelm you. It'll go on for the rest of your life, bit after bit being chopped off. He says the kingdom is yours because you've become a truth seeker in a serious sense. And all truth is ultimately his, so you get to Christ. Uh, my wife is telling me to stop, but I will finish this, right? You wouldn't want me to stop in the middle of these. No, that's good. You can tell her afterwards, and then I can approach her about half an hour's time saying it was all right. But what that leads to is the next one, which is the next discipline, which still happens in an Anglican church, but doesn't happen in a liturgical churches now. Repentance. Blessed are those that mourn, for they uh, shall be comforted. Mourning is not something we can do, though. Repentance is a gift. You have to ask for it. Lewis again. Repentance is not something God demands of you that he could forgo if he wishes. Repentance is simply a description of what coming to God is like. If you have not felt deeply repentance, you haven't been in God's presence because that's what happens. Think of Isaiah, think of John on Patmos. That's what always, he's pure holiness. Fortunately, he doesn't let us get too close. We'd be wiped out. But that's what you should expect. That's why repentance matters. Why it should be in every service. What that leads to is becoming meek. Uh, the word that's translated meek is used to describe a horse that is trained and is ready to ride into battle. Do you get the picture? You are meek when you wake up after insight and repentance and say, Lord, thank you, ride me into battle today. That's meekness. And you inherit the earth, not the material one, but love, joy, peace, the gifts of the Spirit. Now, shall I let you work the rest out for yourself or do you want me to go quickly through them? Ah, okay. Enough. Those that want to leave can. It's all right. Join my wife. Take her for, take her for a coffee. Um, the, the next one is interesting. Once you start, you want more. So blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. You see how they work. Once you see how they work, you don't have to remember them, do you? Just like those... Any, any medical students here? No. Well, I can't use that illustration. Oh, one. Uh, you know that Krebs never knew, the, never learnt the Krebs cycle. When you asked him about it, he'd say, well, let's start with citric acid, and that must do this and this and this, and the whole thing would emerge. He understood it. That's different. What's happening here, when you look at the, the, the Beatitudes, instead of memorizing them, you begin to see how they work, and that's much more important. And when you've tasted, you want more, and he says you will be satisfied. Uh, that leads inevitably, to the next one. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. That's probably the one that's needed in Anglican churches more than any other. When you're standing where I'm standing, not in this church, fortunately, but in many churches, you see people out there whose face has not cracked in a good belly laugh for 20 years. That's very sad. It shouldn't be like that. We're very funny creatures. God made us to be very funny, so we laughed ourselves. But if you don't give mercy, you won't receive it. It's not a curse. It's a statement of moral reality. You haven't understood your own depth of need for mercy. I love that phrase, whose property is always to have mercy in the, the, the communion service, because always to have mercy, because we need it all the while. Uh, that's what mercy is all about. Mercy and truth come together in Christianity. Everywhere else, the truth kills mercy, but not with us, and that's what sets us free. So... 
that leads to the next one, which is, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Kierkegaard's, to be pure in heart is to will one thing. Thy will be done is ultimately the only prayer, and it's the only way to live, live life. And we had that before I spoke this evening. It's important. Uh, and it's releasing, because you don't have to have any big plans for the day. You're a horse being ridden into battle, and you have no hidden agendas. That's very releasing. That makes you, in fact, a peacemaker, which is the next one, because transparent people can make peace. And when you've done that, you'll be persecuted. But the kingdom is yours. It's the only one who repeats, Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you for my name's sake. Rejoice. So rejoicing is not a feeling, because you're not feeling like rejoicing when you're being persecuted. So he gives you two reasons for rejoicing. Look at the company you've joined, and there is a reward in heaven. I go through that sequence every day at some point pretty well. And I cannot recommend it too much. It will change the way you function. Let's pray, and then my wife will be at peace. Lord, we thank you for times like this when we can talk to one another and have a sense of your presence with us. We, we thank you for that. And we pray that something this evening will enter into each one of us in a way that will make our lives closer to what you wish them to be and make this church closer to what you wish it to be. In Jesus' name, amen.